am Bob Coleman. We're talking Main Street and the small lenders who help it grow. Joining us today is Lance Sexton, Katie Watecki, and John Winnick. John, it's been too long since you and I have talked. Way too long. Good to hear. Good to hear from you. John is out of uh, Illinois, Chicago, I believe, uh, Clark Street Capital. John, what do you do? Uh, so our company uh, sells loan portfolios, values loan portfolios, and also manages portfolios on behalf of banks and private equity. Very good. You're also involved, uh, aren't you on the board of a, of a CDC? I chair the board of Summer Corps, which is the largest CDC headquartered in Chicago. Good for you. Good for you. Um, I think, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned, but you're the CEO. There's our certificate. Let's go right to the polls. Have you adjusted your 2020 budget to reflect the influence of PPP on your, well, we say portfolio. I think what we really mean uh, on your bottom line as well. So basically the question is, have, have you uh, redone the budget? What do you think, Lance? Well, I'm, I'm not surprised that uh, quite a few people have not redone their budget because this was a really quick thing that popped up and uh, should have had a positive impact on the net income of, of the institutions that participated. Uh, but uh, I'm not surprised, Bob, that everybody didn't revise their budget. Are you concerned? This is sort of the thing that I'm tracking, John. You may have an opinion about this also. Are you concerned about your CR commercial real estate loan portfolio? And I'm not just talking SBA. I'm talking general. John, I, I read a bunch of stuff about malls or continue to shed retailers. I guess there's been 15 major bankruptcies of major retailers. Uh, what do you see from your perch? Well, I mean, I think, um, I mean, it's definitely early. Uh, I kind of go into my presentation about that, but um, okay. yeah, certainly um, the last two months of, is about finding out who's paying. Um, and there's been, you know, various short-term um, re lease renegotiations that a lot of landlord and tenants have gone about. And so I think we have a better sense now of, you know, which tenants are viable, which tenants are paying. Um, but um, for the most part, so many of these loans are in a forbearance period that um, they haven't necessarily needed all their rental income to make the loan payments since they're in a forbearance. Very good. And finally, um, uh, what is your attitude toward current economic environment? Um, Katie, we, we, we ran an article on uh, Main Street money. What, what, is, what are the Main Street numbers? What are entrepreneurs feeling these days? There are significantly more businesses reopening right now. I believe we're, we're close to eight and ten businesses are reopened now. Uh, some small businesses are still saying they're concerned about uh, COVID and with everything else going on right now, but uh, significantly less than expected are now saying that they're not extremely worried anymore. A lot of them are starting to feel a little more comfortable with it. Yeah, but, but one out of five thinks we're uh, going in the tank and we're going to be living in caves soon. Short-lived recession. Uh, let, me, let me go around the horn. Lance, what do you think? Uh, you know, Bob, there's not a response that fits how I feel about it. Uh, well, I don't know that it's going to be. <laughs> well, I don't know that it's going to be a short-lived recession, Bob. I'm I'm not sure that we're heading into depression, but I do think that there is a lot of federal government money that's propping up the economy right now. So the question to me becomes, what happens when the money goes away? What, what happens, you know, it's just like all the small businesses that got PPP loans. What happens when they finish their covered period and have spent the money and they're operating at 30 or 40 percent of capacity? So I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, predicting doom and gloom, but I don't think it's going to be short-lived. I think we'll feel it for an extended period of time. Go, yeah. back, go back one slide, Joseph. John, what do you think? Yeah, I think we're in a... Um, short-lived depression um, turning into a more mild recession and then a you know slower recovery uh, you know Lance you touched on it we're going from massive stimulus right now to what I'd call negative stimulus which is you know go into say October you have to make payments in your SBA loans your initial forbearance period is is over and now you have to make payments oh by the way the unemployment benefits have now run out and the PPP money has run out so 
the big question is how the economy responds to the negative stimulus. Um, and hopefully that's offset by the economy reopening. Katie, what do you think? Well, I'm the baby in the room, so I haven't really experienced too much of the, the recession. You're allowed an opinion. You're, you're <laughs> talking to stuff every day. I'm, I'm, currently, I'm seeing it seems like a bit of a recession, but I could see maybe a short-lived depression, like John was saying. Um, I just don't really know for sure, because I was young at the time when the, the last recession was. Uh, and, and Bob, this this one's different. It. It, it impacts businesses and people across the board. If we remember our recession back 08, 09, and 10, uh, people were still traveling. You, I was not afraid at that time to hop on a plane and run out to L.A. and enjoy myself. Or, um, and, and the recession was kind of real estate specific. This is across the board. I, I think that we're going to, and I think John's going to talk about it, uh, and he made a great comment. We've got a lot of SBA borrowers right now who have six months worth of payments being made for them. What happens in October when it's time to make their own payment? Now, most small businesses will be fine, but some may not be ready for that. Right. And, and Lance, I know you're going to talk about this in your webinars, but unfortunately, sometimes entrepreneurs don't know when to pull the plug. And I know there's a number of entrepreneurs out there. They should, they should have pulled the plug, and they're just limping along until October. And that's not doing them any good, their employees any good, or the lender any good. Hey, John, uh, what do you want to talk to us about? Um, so just kind of get going an overview of kind of where we are right now in a uh, problem asset cycle. Um, I think, you know, the big question we're getting from a lot of folks is, you know, how bad is this going to get? Um, and I'll kind of get into why this is sort of evolving slowly in a minute. But, um, you know, the best base case for where we're at right now is 2008. Um, and in this slide, you can pretty much, this all comes from the quarterly banking profile. So the last number is basically, you know, effectively the problem assets in the banking system. Okay. And the reason I start with, with uh, 2006, Q1, is that's when problem assets were at their lowest. And Q1 2010 is when they peaked in the last cycle. Um, so you can see between 2006, the start, and 2010, there was about a five to six-fold increase in problem assets. If you look at where we were in Q4 2019, we don't yet have the first quarter numbers because the FDIC is a little slow in doing its quarterly banking profile. Um, but you can see we're starting at around 217 billion of problem assets. Um, if it gets to the 2010 levels, you're at about a threefold increase in problem assets. So anyway, you want to look at it, you're going to see a three to a tenfold increase in workout assets. Um, you know, on the positive side, the banking industry is in solid financial shape. Um, Many banks have successfully raised capital. I really can't think of a major bank that I'm particularly worried about. Having said that, um, according to uh, Kashkari of the Fed, who's the Minneapolis Fed chair, um, the banks are going to need to raise $200 billion in capital. So to say that it's going to be totally painless for the banks is not accurate. Um, I will take you back to the, to the um, stress tests, which were done uh, earlier this year. The Fed's base case for the extreme adverse scenario, sorry, the severely adverse scenario is 10% unemployment, check, GDP falling 8.5%, check. And the last one, we don't have that yet, um, and that's a big discussion point, but declines of 28 and 33% in home prices in Sierra. Those, those are shocking numbers, John. I mean, this is uh, how much did the real, real estate decline during the recession? Uh, I think it was around 40% um, yeah. uh, nationwide. So, you know, it's not a crazy number. Um, I don't think the lending this time around was as, you know, there are very few loans today that were bad loans on arrival, um, aside from taxi medallion loans or a few others I can think of. <laughs> very few loans that at origination seem like stupid loans. But, you know, when you have this level of unemployment, you're going to have, you know, losses. And so banks are going to be seeing a three to tenfold increase in problem assets, and they really have two choices. Um, they either need to bolster their workout departments, 
uh, and sell loans. Uh, and fortunately, we do both. So uh, that's our little sales pitch. Great. Well, one of the things I'd like to do is put this into context. And we, this is definitely different than it was 10 years ago. Uh, number one, I know Katie's going to talk about a, a bank that closed, but that's the first bank closure in seven years. Ten years ago, we had banks closing Fridays, you know, two, three uh, period. Credit was definitely constricted. Um, yeah, you could look at the um, unemployment and GDP numbers, but these are different type of numbers than we experienced during the recession, right, John? Yes. So, I mean, in some respects, it's it, it's certainly better from the quality of the loans that are in the banking system. That's a big if, because there's some really bad loans that are outside the banking system. But from the, the quality loans of the banking system, they're certainly better. Um, certainly the bank's capital positions are better. But, I mean, the level of job losses and um, an acceleration of some other trends, you know, people moving out of retail, people working from home, is certainly going to cause some negative repercussions. John, uh, give us the – my eyes are glazing over slide. That, <laughs> dumb this down for us in the next slide, Joseph, please. <laughs> so, this is important. Okay. So – this slide is to basically explain why things are sort of evolving slowly. Um, one of the unheralded aspects of the CARES Act is an extraordinary concession of the banking industry. As you know, I'm very pro-bank, but I, I did chide the bankers for complaining uh, a few weeks ago and then got a lot of bankers complaining about me saying they were complaining, which sort of proved my <laughs> point. Um, they have got an extraordinary concession from Congress. Um, basically, if you have a loan that was a good loan on on December 31st, 2019, um, and you modify it due to COVID-19, which pretty much applies to every business in the country, you don't have to write that loan down. You don't have to regrade that. You're essentially suspending a uh, gap um, and, and the treatment of, of uh, restructured loans. So these are not TDRs. Now, the important thing is this doesn't last forever. Um, it ends. Let me, let, me, let me interrupt you there, because during the Great Recession, lenders had to write down these assets, correct? There was no concession granted. There was nothing like this. Right. And the idea behind this is, OK, let's let's not um, let's encourage the banks to work with their borrowers, not go in this whole question. Is this a TDR? Should we do this? The idea was to encourage banks to make these modifications. Effectively, banks robo-signed these modifications. Um, no workout officer at any bank I've talked to has spent one second on any of these forbearance loans, uh, free forbearance modifications. Um, so, you know, obviously, um, if the workout department hasn't looked at these loans and they were sort of granted automatically, you have a period where they do become TDRs and banks will have to decide in the third and fourth quarter what they want to do. If they do nothing, you have to expect that some percentage of these loans will become TDRs. Now, that's the million-dollar question. If we go into the next slide, um, you can kind of see what the banks did in the first quarter. Um, and again, don't pay too much attention to the ones that are on the low side of this, because it might simply be by March 30th, they were slow in doing their modifications, whereas some of the banks that are high here did their modifications more quicker. Um, but, you know, you're talking about, you know, roughly 20% of all loans are in forbearance. Um, so let's just say a quarter of those um, become TDR. So 75% go back to normal. Everything's fine. The economy reopens. Well, that's still a pretty substantial increase in problem loans, and that aligns pretty well with our three to tenfold increase in workout assets. John, tell us about the next slide. Um, when you say performance, can you be more specific? What what, what are we? Uh, what sure. are you talking about? Performance. Oh, yeah, and this is this is the market's opinion um, and of how certain rates have performed. This is not a terrible baseline for evaluating property performance. The problem we have right now is when the courts are closed, or they've been largely closed. You can't evict tenants. You can't foreclose. Um, there's not many sales of properties going on right now. So it's hard to really know what the impact on values, right? Um, we did a poll question on another webinar. And, you know, 
um, home prices, for example, um, there are people who think home prices are going up. And there are people thinking it's going to be 20% decline in home prices or maybe more. So there's this debate now on collateral values, and no one really knows the answer yet. Um, I have my own opinions, but as you can see from the re, re perspective, the malls are really doing the worst, hotels kind of surely behind, and then the best would be data centers, industrial, you know, office. There's a big question are people going to go back to the office? Um, a lot of chatter from the big banks that they'll never return to their pre office, pre COVID 19 office levels. So this gives you an idea of kind of how different property types have performed. I can give you some anecdotal evidence on the reopening. I spent uh, 60 days in Arizona, spent the last two weeks in the most uh, busiest area in all of Arizona, Old Town Scottsdale, and I watched them reopen. And I kind of think the bars and restaurants are going to be fine. And the reason I say that is I think people really crave going back to their favorite restaurant. Now, obviously, social distancing influences how many people you can serve, but I think there's a strong desire to go back to some normalcy, you know, go to the restaurant, go to the bar, et cetera. Um, on the other end, I really saw no desire of anybody to go into the mall. And the Scottsdale Mall, I think, is the busiest mall. Interesting, in interesting observation. It was, yeah. it was looted uh, as well, and um, that didn't help. But, um, you know, the, the mall was basically dead. Now, Nordstrom hadn't opened, the Apple Store hadn't opened. So part of that is the national retailers have been very cautious. So you have a sort of partial reopening of some of these malls. So it's a little early to tell, but you're probably not walking into a shopping mall to go to Cinnabon or Foot Locker. I mean, you're probably going because you want to see you know, the big drivers. So let's just give you an idea of kind of what we're seeing. John, in your role as a, as a director of a CDC, are you, tell us how you're reconciling this chart with uh, commercial real estate 504 loans. Yeah, um, I think the slide went back. Um, go back one, go forward one. I think you're talking about the the firm, the slide? I mean, just in general, I guess, are you changing your credit box? Are you uh, yeah, your I think credit the thing underwriting standards? I guess here's the question. Your credit underwriting standards for 504 loans, have they changed based on what you see in performance in the marketplace? Not necessarily. I mean, I think the big problem is a lack of demand for um, borrowers to, um, you know, obviously you can do refinances in 504, but not many people right now are buying a building or buying equipment. So, you know, that's obviously staying the way. I mean, I did talk to a real estate broker a couple of weeks ago. He basically said they're doing nothing right now. Uh, he does sit real. Um, I, I do have a slide that I can't share with you here. But to give you an idea on how much of this is on small businesses, Bank of America was one of the few banks, few large banks that did disclose all their deferrals, and they did it by um, by by loan type. Um, so, so co lending, Bank of America was at three percent, HELOCs at five six percent, mortgages were at seven percent, small business cards and consumers were at five percent. You know what small business loans were? 32%. So this is very much, unfortunately, a small business uh, recession. Um, the small business loans, you could argue, are like the subprime loans of the last cycle. They seem to be performing much worse. And again, it's all, it's all sort of covered by the fact that if they're SBA loans, they're making six months of payment or these deferrals. At some point, you know, the music's going to stop and we're going to have to ask the hard question of, is this small business viable? And I don't think that question has really been answered. You can kind of see overall, um, certainly heavy deferments on the commercial side, less on the consumer side. Um, the consumer under $100,000 a year. Um, the unemployment insurance has been so generous that some people have not wanted to go back to work. Right. Um, and you know, in a, if you're in a class B, class C apartment building, you have no excuse to not pay your rent. Um, so it's a little better at the low end, but um, Certainly, we're seeing a lot of stress among the small business and CRE borrowers. Great. Um, let's do this. Joseph, do we have a slide? Do we have Katie's slide on, for, on the fraud? Yeah. Uh, let's, let's wrap up the program. Uh, this is a story we uncovered, Katie. It's a wild story. I'll let you tell it. Well, I just started looking into it. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to pull the, uh, the, the records yet for it. 
But what happened is this woman in Texas, who is a, a former bank president, recently admitted to setting her records on fire, including the whole bank itself, um, to hide over 100 fake loans worth about $11 million. So I will be covering that more in detail later this week. Yeah, we haven't had a, I, I, we haven't, Lance, we haven't covered the arson. Burn down the file. Uh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <defense. our approach. laughs> I mean, come on. I've, I've seen that one, Bob. You know, in my in my days working with FDIC liquidation, I'm surprised that uh, did not see something like that. But uh, <laughs> never saw a bank set on fire to get rid of the records. <laughs> bank presidents down there with it. I just love it. Hey, uh, we're going to cut it off here. We have a bunch of other stuff. We'll hold over until next week or until tomorrow. John, please, will you come back um, and, and give us an update? L love your stuff. I uh, always love to come on, Bob. Love your audience. Love love working with you guys. Thanks, okay. Lance. Thanks, Katie. John, I've I've enjoyed it a lot, John. The information is great. It good is. Yeah, it's very very useful. Very good information. Uh, and if you want his slides, they are in the dashboard and then go to webinar, so you could print those out uh, to take advantage of. Hey, thank you all for joining us for the Comrin Report live and for supporting America's Main Street, one entrepreneur at a time. Catch you tomorrow. Thanks. <laughs>